Randomizers have to be my favorite way to play Nuzlocke. You never know what you're gonna get. All trainers have completely random teams, and I've even shuffled the abilities, so you never know what's gonna happen. Other than that, I can only catch the first random Pokemon encountered in any given area. Any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever. No items from the bag are allowed in battle. I always play on set mode, and I can't level past the next boss fight's highest level Pokemon until that fight starts. So join me as I attempt to beat a Pokemon Black version Hardcore Nuzlocke using only what the RNG has in store. My randomized starter choices happen to be Muna, Riolu, and Swinub, the latter two being super awesome choices, but I end up going with Riolu. No, no, a thousand times no. Oh man, Bianca's dad won't let her become a member of Club Penguin? That sucks. I name Riolu Brawly, and it has a naive nature, which is absolutely fantastic, and the water availability, I guess, can come in handy? But leaving New Bama Town will get us access to our second encounter of the run, which happens to be a Vulpix. The naughty nature isn't exactly good for Flannery, and the heatproof ability is pretty much wasted on something that already resists fire, but holding a random Razor Fang could definitely come in handy down the road. Wait a second, N gets a Cyndaquil? And his Cyndaquil has drought? Yeah, I'm a little bit jealous, so what? My next encounter on Route 2, however, happens to be a Clink with the amazing Battle Armor ability. I name it Molain, not so much for the fact that the guy uses Steel types, he just really grinds my gears. I then find myself a Flame Orb, which I immediately give to Brawly since he can't get burned anyway. Actually, you know what, a Black Belt is probably a lot more fitting. And with that, we're gonna have to go up against the first gem leader, Crest, whose first Pokemon is randomized into a Mareep. I send in Brawly and go for a Force Palm right away, and ironically, I actually get a Paralysis on an Electric type, which ends up getting a full Para the first turn. Another Force Palm is enough to take it out, and you'd be forgiven for thinking that Crest is an Electric type trainer since he sends in Pikachu next. Another Force Palm amazingly gets another Paralysis, and after a potion, a quick attack it doesn't quite do too much. But because of that Paralysis, I do outspeed with Force Palm the next turn, getting us our first gym badge, but not only that that Riolu finally evolves into a Lucario. And getting it after the first gym is very early, but it's gonna be so helpful in the early game. Another totally random aspect of this run are the TMs, which are also kind of randomized who can learn what. Did you hear that sound coming from the other side of the wall? <laughs> Uh, no, you must have a good ear. My encounter in the Dream Yard happens to be a Why Not, which I name Will, with the Stench ability. Normally a pretty good ability, but since we're never gonna be able to make the target flinch, it, well, stinks. On Route 3, I capture myself a Solosis before going into the cave and facing the Botanists. I then stumble upon the TM for Night Slash and find my next encounter a Mudkip, and who doesn't like Mudkips? I capture it and name it Wallace, and with a quirky nature, it also has the Heatproof ability, which is pretty useless. Then after facing just a few trainers, Wallace gets to level 16, evolving into a Marsh Dom. How do you like the sound of accordions? Uh, they're fine, I suppose. Now I know the power I need, Zekrom. Ooh, do I have to be the guy to tell him it's gonna be randomized? Please be a secret door, please be a secret door, please be a secret door. Before challenging Lenora, I make sure to get everyone to the level cap, evolving Will into Wobbuffet. And with that, the time has come to take on the second gym leader, Lenora, who starts out with an Ammonite, which is oddly fitting since her gym is in a museum. Drought, however, is not exactly helping it out, but I decide to go for a charm the first turn just to lower its attack and see what it's going to do, but it just goes for withdraw, so I go for an Encore, locking it into boosting its defense, which of course gives me a free turn to swap out into Wallace, as she of course boosts her defense another stage. Fortunately though, Mudshot is a special move so we can break through those defenses, taking out the Ammonite. Her Watchhog's randomized into an Electric, which is so lucky for me since normally this thing would have Levitate, but because of the randomized abilities, I can just go for a Mudshot, Water Gun, Mudshot combo to take it out without any problems at all, netting us our second Gym Badge. Team Plasma then decides to steal the Dragonite Skull to break it down into Fertilizer to further their botany. And in pursuing them, I find my next encounter, a Golet. Once in Castellia, we can talk to the scientist who either gives us a Fire, Water, or Leaf Stone to pick up a Fire Stone for Vulpix later down the line. I also make sure to grab the Eviolite. This is bad. Bad, 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 bad. Bad for Team Plasma, or a Plasbad for short. Now that we've chased the Renaissance Fair hippies out of town, it's time to take on the third gym leader, Berg, who starts out with Trubbish, so I go ahead and lead with Will. I decide to swap in my Steel type Brawly as it goes for Sludge, but I then miss a Bone Rush as it can set up a layer of Toxic Spikes. Another Bone Rush is enough to take it out, but those spikes are really gonna make my life difficult as he sends in Chandelure. Those spikes are now powering up its Hex, and it can use Flame Burst 
best against any of my steel types, so I immediately swap out into Wallace, and I guess we'll be putting that heatproof ability to good use tanking a flame burst, but the next turn, a hex takes me down to just 12 HP as I go for a mud shot lowering its speed, which is just enough to survive the poison damage. At this point, since any move could take me out, it's going to be random whether it goes for flame burst or hex, so I decide to swap in Mo Lane in case it goes for flame burst, which it does. That would also have 100% one shot my Lucario, which is the only way I'm going to be able to take this thing out with a power gem. Getting both toxic spikes and hex on a randomized team is actually pretty impressive, but we at least claim our third badge. Then as I make my way over to Route 4, I find my next encounter, my favorite starter of all time, it's Charmander. And it even has one of the best abilities in the game in speed boost, so of course I capture it and name it Blaine. And after just one level of training, it evolves into Charmeleon. I even get lucky enough to find the TM for Flamethrower in the Desert Resort, which means there's no reason to not evolve Vulpix into Ninetales. The Life Orb is also a pretty sweet pickup. Now as soon as I reach Nimbasa, being Unova's top model, I of course have to take part in one of their fashion shows, and I think I did a pretty good job of giving Wobbuffet a makeover if I do say so myself. We then stumble upon my lifelong arch rival, the former Miss Unova, Elisa, but before taking her on, I go to Route 16, finding myself a Carvana that I named Karen, and to Route 5 where my encounter happens to be a Snivy with the awesome Intimidate ability. I of course name it Ramos after the Buttman himself and evolve it into a Servine. And so the time has once again come to face my arch nemesis Elisa. Not knowing what she was going to send out, I decide to go into Will, but it ends up being a chat tot so I can go for a mirror coat after this chatter, which doesn't quite take it out. Expecting a hyper potion here, I decide to take the opportunity to swap out into Brawly, who of course has the power gem, which I can use the next turn to completely annihilate this chat tot. Her next Pokemon is Charmeleon, but since I know that Charmeleon has speed boost and I outspeed the first turn, I can dodge the first attack, but for the second attack, I'm actually slower than Charmeleon because of the speed boost, meaning that I don't get hit and a dig can take it out. Finally, her Zub Strike is randomized into a Nido King, so I decide to take the opportunity to swap out into Wallace, who's holding the Eviolite, so a double kick does basically nothing. A chip away does a bit more damage as we then go for Mud Shot, meaning we can outspeed the next turn with a Water Gun to not put it into Hyper Potion range, after which another Mud Shot is enough to take it out. This does mean I get my fourth gym badge, but best of all, Elisa has to recognize that I am the top model in Unova. Moving on to Driftvale, Clay says that if we find Team Plasma, we get to challenge his gym. Turns out that these guys have been trying to grow herbs of questionable legality in the cold storage. It's freezing with no sunlight. What are they, stupid? Oh, I wonder why I'm getting sleepy for some reason. Yeah, I can think of zero dank reasons why that would be the case, dumbass. Master Ball. Before moving on, I evolved Karen into a Sharpedo, after which it's time to take on Clay. Now, normally, this is one of the gym fights that can be the hardest in all of Pokemon, so it's really all up to the RNG what's going to happen in this one. His first Pokemon is Elekid, though, so I make sure to swap into my ground type as he goes for a light screen, and a dig is enough to take it out. And then his Excadrill randomizes into a freaking Blissey! And this is particularly annoying since it starts to go for Minimize as I go for Dig, which gives it another turn to set up yet another Minimize, but by some miracle, I actually connect with the Dig. Now, since all my other moves are special moves, I decide to swap out into Brawly as it goes for a takedown, which does basically no damage, and I somehow connect with a Force Bomb, so that was way less bad than I thought it would be. Then all that's left to do is taking out the Pidgeotto with a Power Gem, and we've got the fifth badge. Oh man, oh man, oh man, I'm so excited for my Route 6 encounter, what could it be? An unknown! My Charge Stone Cave encounter, on the other hand, happens to be a Mancino, which I catch and name Charon. Next on my journey, I run into the Nugget Brothers, which sounds like it should be a fried chicken restaurant in New York. Nugget about it. Forget about it. I also run into Skyland Juniper's dad on a sugar date. Awkward. After which, I run into my next encounter of the run in Celestial Tower, a Curlia, which I immediately evolve into Gardevoir. Oh, come on. Klutz is like one of the worst abilities. Our next opponent is Skyla, who, funny enough, also leads off the fight with a Chatot. I go ahead and lead with Koga the Viper, who I found right outside Celestial Tower, and a Poison Tail does massive damage with a critical hit. This, of course, means that Skyla uses a Hyper Potion, but after sustaining a fair amount of damage, we manage to take out the Chatot as she sends in her Miltank, expecting her to go for a super 
effective Zen Headbutt, I can swap into Karen, meaning that I can go for a Screech the next turn, lowering the Mill Tank's defense. After tanking a Body Slam very poorly, I swap out a Karen into Brawly, who tanks it way better, and I misclick here going for Quick Attack, which means I have to eat a Zen Headbutt. It even ends up getting a critical hit, which is so funny that it punishes me right there, but Lucario still survives, and we can take it out with a Force Bomb. However, being at this level of health means I don't want to stay in versus Frostlass, so I go ahead and swap out into Flannery, as I have to take a Wake Up Slap. Ominous Wind doesn't do too much damage, and it luckily does not get the Omni Boost, and I can hit it with a Flamethrower deep into the yellow, getting a burn. I decide to stay in and risk the crit, and it fortunately does not get it, and we can hit it with a Flamethrower, taking it out, gaining us our sixth Gym Badge. So Miss Unova was born in New Town, lives with mom. Oh, come on. Why you gotta sell me short like that, man? Now that the level cap has increased to 39, we can evolve Marshtomp into Swampert, Charmeleon into Charizard, and Servine into Superior. In Twisted Mountain, we end up having a familiar showdown with Blaziken versus Charizard, but unlike Ash, my Charizard comes out victorious. Which leads us to Bryson, and there is not much to say about this guy, except he got randomized into two Fearows, and that is unfortunate for him. It it did get down to the wire since he got a crit taking me down to just 17 HP, but in the end, we came out victorious. Now that we've got seven badges, we can head to Dragon Spiral Tower, where I find my next encounter, a very fitting Dratini. I name it Iris, and Flash Fire isn't exactly bad, but it's not doing much for her. This leads us to one of the sloppier mistakes I made while in Relic Castle. Just going for an Aqua Jet, thinking I'd take it out with an Expert Belt, led Karen to getting taken out by a Bug Bite. I didn't know that would crit. I want to speak to the manager. Said Sean. Noises. Ah, I wonder who's calling me. Oh, you picked it up. Hey, Miss Unova. Yeah, I've been avoiding your calls because I didn't want to be the guy to tell you that your dad just bought Skyline an airplane. Uh, why are we all gathered here? Alder told me what's going on. This is an intervention. You just keep saying the word fortunately in your videos and it has to stop. Fortunately, the intervention didn't take too long and we can take on our next opponent, Drayden. He starts out with a mag cargo and I foolishly send in Ramo, so I immediately decide to swap out into Wallace. This does mean that I'm going to have to eat a lava plume and he even manages to get a burn which doesn't make too much of a difference since i am going to use a quad effective special surf to take it out drayden's second pokemon is waylord and since water spout is neutral against wallace i decide to swap out into ramos and it actually still does quite a lot of damage this surprised me quite a bit since superior is a pretty bulky pokemon and it resists it either way a couple of leaf blades is enough to take it out which means we're only left with drayden's strongest pokemon and not only has it randomized into Machamp, it also has the Trace ability, which means we're gonna get intimidated. Since we've sustained a bit of damage, I decide to swap out into Flannery, who gets hit by a submission, but it does way more damage than I expected, so we're just gonna have to swap out again. Liza comes in to tank a Vital Throw, but I forget that she doesn't even have a Psychic move when I send her in, so this is pretty much just a sacrifice, and it's a big reminder to all you guys out there playing Nuzlocke to check what moves your Pokemon have before sending them in. Given the circumstance that it didn't have a psychic move though, it is pretty much a necessary sacrifice to be able to safely get in Blaine to take out the Machamp with a fly. Beating Drayden does mean that we get our 8th and final gym badge, but he also gives us the TM for Tail Glow. Look ma, no legs! It also means we can get to Victory Road to get a final wild encounter, which happens to be a Gligar of all things. I capture it in my Cold Storage Master Ball and name it Bertha, after which it's time to head on to the Pokemon League. But before we go in, we can use that Razor Fang that we ran randomly got on Vulpix on Route 1 to evolve Gligar into a Gliscor. I also make sure to evolve Iris into a Dragonair, and here's my final team going into the Elite Four. The only notable thing for Lucario is the fact that I have the TM for Bolt Strike of all things. Then we've got Iris the Dragonair with Tail Glow, Chatter, Surf, and Agility, a pretty awesome moveset because of our TMs. I also made sure to give her the Experience Share and get her as close to level 51 as possible. The reason I do this is because once we enter the Elite Four, the level cap is broken and any experience experience we get can get us to any level possible. And since I've found two random rare candies on my journey, this means that I want to get to level 53 as fast as possible to get myself a Dragonite. And with our preparations out of the way, it's time to take on the Elite Four, the first of which being Chantal. She leads with a fearsome Alakazam as I lead with Bertha, and her Alakazam actually has Drizzle, setting up the rain permanently. And here I made a huge mistake, giving Bertha the Lucky Egg to get as much experience as possible when really I shouldn't have been holding an item to do as much damage as possible with Alakazam. 
acrobatics. Either way, I managed to get a critical hit versus the Alakazam, taking it out in one hit, and I go ahead and set up a Swords Dance against the Meganium, realizing my mistake. It just goes for a light screen, but even with my Swords Dance, it's not enough to take out the Meganium, but since she's just gonna go for a heal after this sweet scent, I can set up another Swords Dance. And now that I've set up all the way to plus four attack, it is gonna be enough to take out the Meganium in one hit. And Chantal's next Pokemon is gonna be Gothitelle, but here you'll see how much of a difference it makes to have that full power acrobatics. Since we're holding an item, we might as well be using Aerial Ace since it actually has five more base power than what we're currently doing. Chantal's final Pokemon is a Seismitoad. Not wanting to take one of its water moves, I decide to go for a U-turn, which does a huge amount of damage and burns us with Flame Body as we then swap into Ramos. We do, of course, get the Intimidate in case it uses a physical move against us, but it just goes for Acid, meaning that we can go for a stab, quad effective Leaf Blade, taking out the Seismitoad. This, of course, means we move on to the next Elite Four member, Grimsley. And while he's usually up to his creepy dark type shenanigans, this time he leads off with a Slowking and I go for Brawly. We then have pretty much the same idea as I set up a Sword Stance and he goes for Nasty Plot. But his boost is gonna go to waste as I completely annihilate him with a Bolt Strike. His next Pokemon is Dodrio, which doesn't exactly fare better, nor does Ambipom, but his next Pokemon is Vileplume, which I do a bit of damage to with Quick Attack as he misses a Stun Spore. Another Quick Attack makes it look like it's a three hit KO, but this time I get hit with a Stun Spore and getting fully paralyzed the next turn, I decide it's time to swap out into Charizard. This does of course mean that I have to tank a quad resisted Mega Drain, which isn't a problem whatsoever, and we can finish it off with a flamethrower, which means we beat Grimsley. Caitlyn then very rudely slapped through her alarm, not remembering that we have a battle scheduled. She leads off with a Stoutland, which is a pretty good matchup for me leading off with Bertha. However, after realizing that I'm not quite doing half damage with acrobatics, I decide it's time to swap out using U-turn, and luckily this doesn't put Stoutland to the red, but as I swap in Wallace, of course I forget that I have the Rocky Helmet, putting it in the red, which means she's gonna go for a full restore. I then go for a waterfall, but a retaliate crits and hits me down to just 65 HP as my next waterfall gets it down into healing range once again. I decide at this point that my best bet is to just switch into Brawly and try to go for a Force Palm, but it actually roars me out into Gliscor. I decide to risk going for a Sword Stance even if it goes for Roar, but it actually goes for Retaliate, doing pretty pitiful damage as I can then take it out with an Acrobatics. Her next Pokemon is Cloyster, which is definitely my cue to use U-Turn to not get absolutely destroyed by a quad effect of Aurora Beam, so I switch in Lucario, who fortunately has a special move in Aura Sphere to take out the Cloyster in one hit. I then have a quad effective Bolt Strike for the Swana, and her final Pokemon is a Fione, which also gets one shot by Bolt Strike. With three of the Elite Four members down, it's time to face the final Elite Four member, Marshall, who usually has fighting types and fittingly starts out with a Polyrath. I send in Bertha, but it turns out that the Polyrath has Drizzle, but funny enough, it doesn't have any water type moves, so after I hit it with an Acrobatics down into the red, it uses Dynamic Punch, and for a good minute, I was so confused why I didn't get, well, confused, until I remembered that Bertha has Shield Dust, which means she doesn't get affected by secondary effects of moves. After taking out Polyrath, Marshall sends in his Hitmonchan, and not wanting to get hit by an Ice Punch, I go for a U-turn and swap out into Blaine. Now, I know an Acrobatics would probably have been enough to take it out, but I wanted to play it safe, and an Air Slash is enough to just take out the Hitmonchan anyway. At the end of the turn, my speed gets increased by Speed Boost as Marshall sends in his Kecleon with Airlock, which gets rid of the rain. I do end up having to take a Sucker Punch here, but I can fire off a Flamethrower at full force, and the next turn, it's a enough to take it out. This means Marshall is down to his final Pokemon, Simiseer, and I decide to swap into Wallace to really utilize that heat proof and tank a flame burst. It then hits me with a spiteful leer as I go for a waterfall, taking out the Simiseer, which means we beat the Elite Four without losing a single Pokemon. It also means that I've gotten to level 53 with Iris, so I can use my two rare candies to level up to level 55 and evolve into Dragonite. Which means that N's castle rises from underground. And my only question is, how did they get it there? Did they build the thing underground? Excuse me, what? Either way, before we take on N, we have to take on Reshiram, which we actually have to catch, but I decided that I need to beat it in a battle first. Which is gonna be tough, since it randomized into Rayquaza. And I opt to click Mirror Coat with Wallace, as Rayquaza hits me with an Air Slash, and of course it gets the flinch. I then decide to swap out and go into Bertha as the Rayquaza goes for a second Air Slash, which does way more damage than I expected, so I have to swap out again. I do get a little bit of damage with U-Turn as I swap into Brawly when the Rayquaza decides to lock itself into Outrage, which is perfect. It does just under half damage as I go for a Bolt Strike, which clearly does over half of Rayquaza's remaining health and gets the Paralysis. I survive the second Outrage on just 12 HP and click Bolt Strike, but I miss 
miss. However, the Rayquaza gets paralyzed, which means the Brawly doesn't go down. The next turn, I do manage to connect with Bolt Strike, meaning that we defeat Rayquaza without losing a Pokemon. Now, unfortunately, we do have to capture it, but we don't have to add it to our team, so I can just add it to the box and proceed on to face N. It's time we take on this shady botanist once and for all. And his Zekrom is very frighteningly randomized into a Giratina. I, of course, send in Wallace as he instantly goes for Shadow Force. I go from Mirror Coat, hoping for a special move, but of course it fails, and the next turn, it takes me down to about half health with a Shadow Force. My Waterfall does pathetic damage, I just didn't want to switch anything into that Shadow Force, but then I swap into Ramos to get an Intimidate off as it vanishes again. I go for Coil, mostly to boost my defense, as another Shadow Force doesn't do too much damage, and I can hit it with a Leech Seed the next turn. And since Giratina's legendary, it has huge HP, we get so much HP back from Leech Seed every single turn. However, at this point, Aurasphere is chipping me down quite low, so I decide to swap out into Iris. Dragonite is of course going to resist the Aurasphere with its flying typing, and the next turn I can go for a Chatter, which takes it down into the red as I get hit by a Shadow Claw, which of course means that N uses a full restore. I then seize the opportunity to use a Tail Glow, and I go for one the next turn to get to plus six as well. Out of the randomized TMs I found, I got very few that were actually useful, but Dragonite could learn a lot of them. However, even being at plus six special attack and using a stab chatter, it's not enough to take out the Giratina from where it was at. But together with the Leech Seed, it's gonna be just enough, which means we now have a Dragonite at plus six special attack and plus two speed. And as you might imagine, even though N's team is randomized into a pretty formidable squad, this is gonna tear through his entire lineup. But we're not at the finish line yet, since we still have one more opponent to face, the big boss himself, Getsis. The master botanist fittingly starts out the fight with a semi-sage as I send in Wallace. And of course, being at a huge type disadvantage, I decide to swap out into Blaine to tank a seed bomb. The next turn, the monkey with the sick hairdo leers at me as I hit it with a stab super effective flamethrower to end its career. This, of course, gives me a speed boost as Getsis sends in his next Pokemon, Cloyster. I decide to send in Brawly as Getsis just sets up a layer of spikes. Now, before the Rayquaza fight, I did give Brawly a fighting gem, which is going to mean that we can hit this thing with the overkill of the century as we get a critical hit as well. Against Ms. Magius, I swap in Bertha to tank an Astonish, but since Astonish seems like the only move that this Ms. Magius wants to go for, it's very simple for me to just spam acrobatics and take it out. Funny enough, Getsis' next Pokemon is a second and Semi Sage, he just really loves that hairdo. But we've got the perfect move to trim that thing down with acrobatics. Amazingly, Getsis' second to last Pokemon is Genesect, and I don't know what could be more fitting, but I decide to use U turn since I don't want to eat a tri attack here and swap out into Blaine. The incoming tri attack does end up doing quite a lot of damage, and it's unclear whether or not it's a two hit KO. I decide to stay in and find out, and the second tri attack leaves me at 21 HP and paralyzed, but I do break through with the quad effective flame thrower taking out that bug. And after Life Orb, I have just enough HP for Charizard to survive as Getsis sends in his final Pokemon, Dusk Noir. To preserve Charizard, I swap into Ramos to get an Intimidate to lower this thing's attack, and Shadow Punch barely does anything. I then set up a Leech Seed to try and get some residual damage, and Hex does too much for me to stay in, so I swap into Wallace. And after Spikes, Hex barely does any damage at all, and the next turn, I go for a Waterfall, which looks like it's a two-hit KO as I get locked in with Mean Look. Another Waterfall, Seal the deal, meaning that I got through the entire Pokemon League without losing a Pokemon. And that's how I beat a Pokemon Black version Hardcore Nuzlocke using only random Pokemon. I had a lot of fun playing this run, I loved doing the Ultra run, so I just felt like doing another random one, and I honestly feel like doing another one live. So if you want to see that run live, remember to follow me on Twitch, and make sure to have your notifications on on this channel so you don't miss a community post with the announcement when I'm going live. And if you're at this point in the video, and you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you doing? Now get about it.